I rise today to address the nomination of Chief Justice Merrick Garland to the United States Supreme Court. Today marks 84 days since President Obama nominated Judge Garland to fill the vacant seat on the Supreme Court bench. In that time, the consequences of permitting that vacancy to persist have become clear. The eight-member court has now deadlocked four times, and in two cases where the court found itself evenly divided and unable to reach consensus, it, it punted, sending cases back to the lower courts. There is no denying it, the Senate's refusal to do its job to take up the business of filling that vacant seat means that in some cases the court is not able to fulfill its, its core function, meaning that in some cases the court um, does not resolve circuit splits and cannot serve as the final arbiter of the law. That's not just my view, that's an an opinion shared by one of the court's current members, Associate Justice Anthony Kennedy. Testifying before the House Appropriations Committee back in 2013, Justice Kennedy described what happens when the court is, uh, is short-sapped. And although he was discussing the effect of recusals on the ability of the court to do its job, his comments are no less relevant in the case of vacancy. This is what Justice Kennedy said, and, and I quote, on our court, if we recuse without absolutely finding it necessary to do so, then you might have a 4-4 court and everybody's time is wasted. Let me say that again, everybody's time is wasted. Well, Mr. President, my Republican colleagues don't seem to be bothered by wasting everybody's time. 116 days ago, less than an hour after the news of Justice Scalia's death, the majority leader proclaimed that the Senate would not consider replacement until after the presidential election. He said, quote, the American people should have a voice in the selection of their next Supreme Court justice. In the 116 days since the majority leader made that bold announcement, Republican senator after Republican senator has taken to the Senate floor to deliver variations on that theme. My good friend Senator Cornyn helpfully explained that Republican, Senate Republicans had made a decision to, quote, give the voters a voice on who makes the next lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. He said, quote, I want to be clear that the American people do deserve a voice here, and we will make sure that they are heard. We've been through this before, Mr. President. We agree the American people should have a voice in this process, and they did. They elected Barack Obama to be President of the United States. And by my read of the Constitution, Article 2, Section 1, to be exact, the President shall, quote, hold his office during the term of four years, a term which has not yet expired. So it seems clear to me in the text of our founding document that our democracy was designed to ensure that its citizens have a voice in this process. President Ronald Reagan made this point quite eloquently when he presided over the swearing in of not just William Rehnquist, as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but also one Antonin Scalia as Associate Justice. President Reagan explained that, quote, the Founding Fathers recognized that the Constitution is the supreme and ultimate expression of the will of the American people. And of course, President Reagan was right. The Founding Fathers recognized that the very purpose of the Constitution was to embody the spirit and the voice of the American people. So I find it preposterous when my Republican colleagues who re purport to revere the Constitution and the framer's original intent insist that the only way to guarantee that the people's voice is heard is to delay filling the vacancy because after all, the founding fathers didn't just contemplate 
such a situation. They actually experienced it. When President John Adams, himself a founding father and a drafter of the Declaration of Independence, was presented with the opportunity to appoint, to appoint a Supreme Court justice, he was himself a lame duck president. The Chief Justice at the time, Oliver Ellsworth, resigned after the 1800 presidential election, an election that President Adams lost. Nevertheless, Adams set about the work of selecting a replacement, and when he eventually nominated John Marshall in January of 1801, more than two months after losing the election, to a president of a different party, and the country still didn't know who that would be because Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, and Aaron Burr had tied, but they were not his political party. Adams, despite an unresolved election and in a face of great uncertainty, the, the, he appointed, he nominated Justice Marshall, and the Senate took up John Marshall's nomination and confirmed him to the post of Chief Justice on January 27, 1801, by voice vote. John Adams was, by every def definition of the term, a lame duck president. The Senate could have refused to fill the vacancy they could have left the Supreme Court short-staffed. Senators could have insisted that the seat not be filled until it was clear just exactly who the American people had selected as their next president. But the Senate recognized that it had a constitutional obligation to confirm a replacement. And that should come as no surprise because of the 32 senators serving in the 6th Congress, five of them had been delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Abraham Baldwin of Georgia, Jonathan Dayton of New Jersey, John Langdon of New Hampshire, Governor Morris of New York, whose first name was Governor. But he, was, he wasn't a governor. His mother's maiden name was Governor. And Charles Pinckney of South Carolina. All of them, real. these are real founding fathers. If anyone should have known what the Constitution required in this situation, it was them. Now picture them, milling about the floor of the old Senate chamber on January 27th, 1801, talking amongst themselves to their colleagues and whipping votes. Now, at the time, the Senate's practice was to consider nominations in an executive session with the doors closed. Only senators and certain staff were allowed in the chamber, and the proceedings were intended to be secret. So the congressional record contains no debate on John Marshall's nomination. So we can only imagine what senators said, but I suspect it went Something like this. Well, John, Abraham, Governor, I suppose we should vote now on the President's nomination to the Supreme Court. Why, yes, Jonathan, of course. I remember when we wrote it into the Constitution that when a vacancy occurs, the President shall appoint a nominee to fill the vacancy, and we senators shall provide our advice and consent. Oh, yes, John, I recall the day we wrote that. You were in a particularly good mood because your wife Betsy had arrived by carriage the night before from New Hampshire. Oh, yes, Abraham, I recall that well. After all, it was only 13 years ago. And the next day, we wrote the provisions about the Supreme Court. I remember very well how specific we were. The president appoints a nominee in the event of a vacancy, and we in the Senate do our job 
bribe providing advice and consent. By, so by all means, let's vote. These men, these founding fathers, set aside whatever reservations they may have had about the unique circumstances surrounding John Marshall's nomination. A lame duck president of a different party than the party that won the presidential election. And they allowed the Senate to hold a vote. These are founding fathers who wrote the Constitution. As a consequence, John Marshall went on to serve as our nation's fourth Chief Justice, authoring opinions that make up the foundation of constitutional law. It was obvious to those founding fathers in the Senate, as it should be to all of us serving here today, that the Supreme Court is too important, too central to our democracy to, to ignore. I urge my colleagues, particularly those motivated by a fidelity to the framers original intent to end their obstruction and grant the president's nominee full and fair consideration. Thank you, Mr. President.